Hi everyone, this is our channel, Meet the Real Story. Please, like, share and subscribe. There are different kinds of pranks. Some are funny, some are boring, and some have serious consequences. My small innocent prank turned into a horror movie. Let me tell you why. My name is Anita, and I'm 14 years old. I live with my parents and my brother Victor. Victor is three years younger than me. We are also close friends. I love reading, writing stories, and most of all, playing pranks on people. I just love to do it. Victor was the cowardly sort, afraid of his own shadow, so I always played pranks on him. His terrified reactions always made me laugh. Whenever he would try to play a prank on me in retaliation, though, I would always see through it immediately. My parents used to spend Halloween at my aunt's house, so one day, I decided to scare him by dressing up like a ghost and hiding in his closet. When he came home and called for me, I didn't reply. He entered his room and opened his closet to hang his coat, only to be confronted by me jumping out and screaming boo in his face. He leapt backwards, wide-eyed and terrified. He screamed like a girl. I was rolling on the floor, laughing. If he wasn't such a coward, I wouldn't have had any fun at home. One day, he joked, your pranks are going to be the death of me. When he turned 17, Victor received a scholarship to the state university. I saw him off with tears in my eyes, hugged him, and gave him a present marked don't open until you arrive at your dormitory. Shortly after he arrived, he video called. He had blue powder all over his face and looked hilarious. He said, very funny, ha ha ha. You have to stop these pranks, sis. We're too old for this stuff now. Oh, how I missed him. I laughed. With him gone, everything was so boring. When October came and Halloween was only a few days away, the doorbell rang, and I opened the door to find a letter lying on our doorstep. I opened it and found a picture of Victor. His face had been beaten black and blue. He looked horrible. I opened the letter and read, Victor got involved in drug dealing and now owes us a lot of money. If you don't pay off his debt as soon as possible, we will kill him, and you too. Do not call the police, or he will only die sooner. Panicked, I called the thug's phone number, written at the end of the letter, but there was no answer. Victor was such a sweet and innocent guy. I couldn't believe he had gotten himself involved in drug dealing. I thought of calling my parents, but I decided not to, because they would definitely call the police. So I spent the next two days thinking. Then, the home phone rang, and I felt my heart sink to my feet. I slowly picked up the receiver. Do you have the money? The caller asked in a cold voice. I need more time. I don't have that much money, I pleaded. The voice replied. You seem to think we are joking. Okay. The next photo we send you will be that of your brother's dead body. He said that. Then he hung up the phone. My stomach wrenched. I felt sick and tried to call my parents, but I couldn't reach them. The next day, I heard a knock on the door, and when I opened it, there was another note lying on the doorstep. It read, The Angel of Death Comes Today. My parents were at my aunt's. I was alone and didn't know what to do. I closed all the windows and curtains and locked all the doors. I turned off the lights. At the stroke of midnight, I heard a noise outside my house. I peeked out a window and saw a man, all in black, in my front yard. He was walking towards the back of the house. Shortly after that, I heard the back door open. I ran and hid myself in the closet. Eventually, I heard my bedroom door open slowly. I heard footsteps walking around my room, as if the intruder were searching for me. Suddenly, my closet door opened. I panicked, pushed the masked intruder and dashed out of my room and down the hall to the dining room. Victor's decapitated head was on the table. Oh my god. My last thought before I fainted was that if the drug dealers were going to kill me too, just as they promised. Goodbye life, I thought. When I woke up, I saw my parents and Victor, dressed in black. They all began laughing hysterically. Angry, I snapped. What's going on? Why are you all laughing? This isn't funny, Victor confessed between laughs. It was just a prank, sis. 
and you should have seen the look on your face when I opened the closet door. From that day on, I never played pranks on anyone ever again. My name is Ginny. You can call me Bad Girl if you like. That's what the neighborhood kids called me. I have a long story to tell you. I was the eldest of five siblings. My mother died of illness, and my father was crippled in a car accident. He couldn't walk, and he had to use a wheelchair. Seeing my siblings suffer from hunger and poverty was a constant sight at home. My father was depressed. Our neighbors helped us a lot, but I was constantly worried what would happen if they ever stopped. So I decided to try and find a job. I knew it wouldn't be easy, because I was only 15. Who'd want to hire a 15-year-old? Though I was apprehensive and lacking confidence, I made up my mind to get a job. I went to many places, clothing shops, flower shops, grocery stores. The answer was the same. We're not hiring at the moment. One day, feeling down, I was walking aimlessly with no destination in mind, when suddenly I found myself near a hospital. On an impulse, I entered. I saw a nurse, but she seemed too gloomy to talk, so I looked around and found another nurse, who looked a bit kinder. She noticed me, and asked if I needed any help. I told her that I was looking for a job. Any job. I'd even mop and clean. She felt sympathy for me, and told me not to worry. Then, she went into the manager's office. I was worried. Was I in trouble? A minute later, she called me in to meet the manager. He seemed very kind, and he quietly asked for my name. I told him it was Ginny. He told me that Martha, the kind nurse who was helping me, told him that I was looking for any job available. He said he had a job for me, but he was concerned that it might be a problem. I felt a pang of fear, and asked what the problem was. He said that I would have to work night shifts. That was it? I felt so relieved. I immediately agreed, and he said that he liked my enthusiasm and that I could start tomorrow. I was so happy. I returned home quickly, hugged my siblings, and kissed my father's hands. I told them everything about my new job. My father looked at me sadly and said that I was too young to have to bear this responsibility. I told him that it was okay and that I could deal with it. When I went to work at the hospital every night, there was a gang of young kids who were always loitering around the neighborhood. I hoped they wouldn't bother me, but my hopes were in vain. They made fun of me every time I passed them. I never told my family about this, though. I began work as a cleaning lady, but due to my diligence and intelligence, I was able to learn a little bit about nursing. So, I was able to get promoted, first to nursing assistant, then to a nurse. My colleagues supported me a lot. Everything was almost perfect, except for the neighborhood gang that was always bothering me and calling me Ginny the bad girl. I wished they would just go away and leave me alone. Then, one day, a miracle happened. While I was working at the hospital, the neighborhood bullies came in, carrying their leader. He was badly injured. His whole body was covered in blood. They were shouting for someone to help them, and when they saw me, they pleaded with me to save him. I worked quickly with the other staff. His condition was serious. He had been in a terrible motorcycle accident. The staff and I worked feverishly to stabilize his condition and treat him. After stabilizing him, I was exhausted. Suddenly, I felt someone coming close. It was the gang. They apologized for making fun of me and asked me to forgive them. They said they didn't know that I worked at a hospital. I smiled and told them it was okay and that I considered them to be my brothers and sisters. Another nurse went to them and told them that their friend was okay now. I was so happy that my problem was solved. They called me over to talk to their leader. He had tears in his eyes and told me that he was so sorry and asked me to forgive him. He was so sincere that I was moved. I gently asked him to be quiet and get some rest. As I was walking away, he called me and thanked me again. After that incident, the manager called me in and praised me for saving the patient's life that day. I was still a long way from achieving my dreams, but I had a good head start, and the neighborhood gang began calling me the Mercy Angel. Hi, my name is Esmeralda, and I'm 21 years old. In my country, I was a heroine, a patriotic soldier, and a role model for my generation. But every story has a dark side, and the dark side of my story is that I became a traitor to my own country. I have to tell you my story quickly because... Well, you'll find out shortly. My spy career began when some terrorists attacked my country. 
I was assigned to a counter-terrorism battalion, and we were fighting for our lives. Though we were a strong group, the terrorists were suicidal maniacs, who had decimated our troops by just charging into our midst and detonating their explosive vests. Only a few of us survived, fighting against overwhelming odds. Then, an opportunity revealed itself. I noticed that the terrorists were hiding behind some large pipes, natural gas pipelines. As a matter of fact, I shot the biggest pipe and killed them all. I became the heroine to a grateful nation, and suddenly, people were naming their children after me. Everyone wished to be like me. Then, one day, I received a phone call from an anonymous caller who threatened to kill my family if I didn't do what he demanded. So, I met with him and his cronies. The moment I saw him, I could see that he meant business. He was a no-nonsense type of individual. Sure enough, he got straight down to business. He wanted me to tell them all our military secrets, weapons, plans, base, and camp locations, everything. If I didn't agree, they threatened to kill everyone in my family, starting with my father, who lived in another city. He said he was recording our meeting, said that if I betrayed this group, they would send the recording to my leaders. I submitted to their demands, because I couldn't bear to cause my family harm. I now had to wear two faces, the heroine and the treacherous informer. I was pleasantly surprised to find that they paid me well for the information I was passing them. My own country hadn't paid me a dime for being their national heroine. So, at least I felt valued and appreciated by the other side. The utility of the information I was supplying them became evident as I watched news reports of new successful terrorist attacks on our country, military bases, camps, and armories. Naturally, our top brass knew that there must be a traitor in their midst, but they had no suspects because I was being very careful. Then, one day, as I was meeting with my terrorist contact to pass on some more information, our soldiers burst into the room and took the terrorists into custody. It turns out that my side had suspected me and had followed me there. The officer told me that I was the last person he would have ever suspected of being a traitor. I offered my hands to him to be handcuffed and taken in. I figured at least ten years in prison, but he made no move to handcuff me. Instead, he just looked at one of his lieutenants, who then pulled out his gun, pulled back its slide, and chambered a round. It seemed that my sentence was to be executed. Right here. Right now.